This is the Homestead Journey Podcast, the podcast dedicated to the pursuit of self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and sustainability. This is episode number 52 of the Homestead Journey Podcast. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you once again for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us here on the Homestead Journey. My name is Brian Wells. I am coming to you from 3B Farm and Homestead here in beautiful upstate New York. And folks, it has been a busy and very emotional week here on the Homestead. On Friday, something very, very tragic happened. And so that is actually going to be the main topic of charting the course this week. I know I had promised that we were going to talk about winter watering woes this week, but we're going to save that until next week. And instead, the events that took place on Friday will be the main topic of conversation today on Charting the Course. But before we jump into that, let's jump on over to this week's Homestead Happenings, and I will bring you up to date with what has been going on here on 3B Farm and Homestead. Now, if you follow us on Instagram or Facebook, you will have seen a number of canning pictures that we posted this week. And if you're not following us on Instagram or Facebook, why not? (laughs) I do post some things over on Reddit, and I am also on MeWe. The links to those are also in the show notes. As you may remember, last weekend, I butchered off our hens. And so this week was spent in canning chicken and canning broth and canning stock. Now, I honestly am not really quite sure what the difference is between broth or stock. I have Googled it. I have looked at a variety of different definitions and where I have landed, and I may be wrong on this. And if you have any insight into this, I would be more than happy to receive some feedback from you. (laughs) But the way I differentiate between broth and stock is to me, broth is simply the bones and some meat cooked down and that's it. Whereas stock would have maybe some carrots and some onions and some bay leaves, some kind of added something to it. Now, I could be way off base, but that's how I am differentiating between the two. So if you hear me use the term broth versus stock, that's how I see it in my head. And we cooked up and then canned up both. What I did is I started by throwing half of the backs in my big, huge roasting pan, and I cooked them down for about 24 hours, and I did not add anything to it. It was just the backs, the necks, whatever. I cooked it down, and then I skimmed out the bones and the skin and the meat, whatever was left, put it off to the side, and I took that broth and I canned it up. And I took those bones and meat and I stuck them on ice in a cooler, and then I went ahead and the second half of the chicken backs and necks and so forth, I put those in the roasting pan and I cooked those down, and I took that broth and I canned it up. And then I took those bones that were left and that meat and I added some onions and some bay leaves and some carrots and I cooked it down a second time and I canned that up as stock. And then I took the bones and whatnot that I had sitting on ice and I dumped that in the roasting pan and added onions and carrots and bay leaves and I cooked that down and I canned that up as stock. So I don't know if I did it right, but let me tell you something. It sure tasted good. And I think it's going to be great as we use it over the next uh, several weeks and months. But when it was all said and done, I had canned up 45 quarts of chicken, 42 pints of broth, and then the stock I canned up in pints. And I have these, they're actually a jelly jar. They're bigger than a half pint. They're like a three quarter pint jar because I was running out of pint jars. So I was like, I got to do something here. 
So I did 21 pints of stock and then 10 three quarter pint jars of stock as well. So I got 31 jars of stock, 42 pints of broth, and then the 45 quarts of chicken. And so very excited about that. Some of it is gonna be going to my mom and dad. And then obviously the rest of it will be using over the winter. Very excited about that. One of the other things I did is I found this week some jars of applesauce that we canned up in I think 2016 or 2017 that had gotten put in the wrong spot. And I needed the pint jars for the broth and the stock. And I had been wanting to make apple butter. So what I did is I took that applesauce and I put it in the slow cooker and I added some spices and I added some sugar and I cooked all of that down into some awesome, awesome apple butter that I then canned up again in uh, actual jelly jars. So I did 24 half pints of apple butter and then 12 of the quarter pint jars of apple butter. And let me tell you something, folks. It is absolutely delicious. But that helped free up some pints and I actually used up all of my pint jars. I have no more pint jars. Well, that's not true because we happened to be at the grocery store and I saw they had three cases of pint jars. Now, I think I am done with canning for this season by and large. There may be a few things that pop up here and there, but by and large, I'm pretty sure I'm done. I've got the tomatoes in the freezer that I need to pull out. I'll cook those down into sauce, but there's really not much else that I have any kind of hope of canning. So I didn't buy all three cases of pint jars, but I did buy one case of pint jars. I left two cases for other people. Didn't want to be greedy. <laughs> so I do have a case of pint jars. So I may go ahead and pull some of those tomatoes out of the freezer and make up some more of that seasoned tomato sauce that we really, really enjoy. But anyhow, that's where we're at with regards to the canning. This week, we also set up for our new boar that we picked up on Saturday. Our new boar, Boris, is in the house, but getting him here was a bit of an adventure. But before I get to that, we did set up a, basically it's a quarantine area. It's four hog panels that I have set up in a square. I moved over the pallet house for him and I think it's going to work out very, very well. It's been tough to get hog panels. It's one of those things that at least in our area, our tractor supply and the tractor supply the next town over have been out of hog panels for a month. And I've been looking and looking and looking. Now our local feed store, I contacted them, I think it was a week and a half ago and they were out, but they were able to order some in. So I picked them up. I paid a little bit more than I would at Tractor Supply, but I'm supporting the local company, so I'm good with that. But we got that all set up this week, and then we went to pick up Boris. And let me tell you something, folks, that was an adventure. First of all, Boris was in a small enclosure, and it, it was a very small dog kennel that was so narrow that I could touch either side with my arms spread out. He was in there with three pink pigs. These pink pigs probably weigh about 200 or two and a quarter. And then there was little old Boris in there. Boris probably weighs 75 to 100 pounds. The pig pen had not been cleaned out that day. So there were about two inches of pig poop on the floor. And I had to climb in there to try to cut Boris out of that group of pigs in a way where we didn't have pigs running all over God's creation. The lady had a one of those concrete mixing tubs, and so I used that as a cutting board. And note to self, I need to buy one of those plastic, actually I'm gonna buy like three of those plastic cutting boards because they would have come in very, very handy in this situation. But I didn't have one of those, so I used the concrete mixing tub to try to 
cut him out of this group of pigs, which didn't work extremely well. He ended up jumping up over the other ones, and then one of them started to pop out, and they were trying to shove the pink pig back in and get the black pig out, and it was just this comedy of errors. And I thought that that was going to be the difficult part of the day. That was the easy part. We got Boris out, we got everybody else locked in and gave them some feed, except Boris was not trained to a bucket. And Boris decided he didn't want to get in the trailer. And so for two hours, we chased Boris all over this lady's backyard. She had a huge field in her back, in the back of her house, and we literally chased this pig around for two hours. I tried using food. He wasn't very interested. He would eat it, but he wouldn't follow it. I tried getting his head in a bucket. No way he was doing that. I tried getting him distracted with food and grabbing his back leg. He was far too strong for me to be able to do that. I tried snaring his back leg with a rope. No way. I, I wasn't able to do it. And it, at this point, it's starting to get dark. This lady lives up on a ridge overlooking a valley, and you could see a storm was heading our way. There was lightning in the, in the far distance. You could hear the thunder boom, and it's starting to get dark. And I've got a black pig running all over this lady's field. At this point, I'm worried whether or not we're actually going to be able to get this pig loaded up and put into the trailer. And so we would chase him and we'd get him cornered and I'd think, okay, maybe we can get him calmed down here and I can sneak up on him. No. For two hours, this goes on. My wife, my son, and this lady who I think is in her late 60s or early 70s, but she certainly was no spring chicken. And we're chasing this pig all over the place. And about two hours in, the pig starts wheezing and I could tell he was getting tired and he would sit down. He would actually, we'd back off a little bit and he would lay down. But as I would get close to him, then he would jump off and he'd, boom, off again. He'd be running again across the field. Finally, I get the pig cornered in her garden and I said, it's now or never. And so I just jump on him and I, 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 I tackle him and I'm holding him in a body lock. The lady had a rope that I had tied a a slip knot in that I was trying to use to snag his back leg. And so we actually put that over his neck and then tied it to his back leg so that if he would kick, it would tighten the noose around his neck and hopefully that would keep him from escaping. And the whole time I'm holding him down. So I holler for my wife, go get the car because the car with the trailer was way up in the middle of the field. So she runs and gets the car. She drives down, but my wife doesn't really back up vehicles, let alone when there's a trailer attached. <laughs> and at the whole time, I can't help her because I'm holding this pig down. I'm on top of it. And he would calm down for a bit and I'd relax. And then he'd start to struggle again and I'm holding that rope. And then he was trying to get away and he starts slipping out of the rope and I grab him by his ears and we get the rope back on him. And finally, we were able to just literally hog tie him and drag him up onto the trailer. We got the trailer closed and he's panting and I'm panting and I'm thinking, whew, I didn't think that was gonna happen. I did not think we were gonna get that pig loaded up. Remember last week, folks, when I told you about the importance of training pigs to buckets? Train your pigs to follow buckets. It will make your life so much easier. <laughs> we got Boris home. Thankfully, the unloading went much better than the loading. Now, he is a bit skittish. It's a new situation, and he's used to being around other pigs, and right now he's quarantined, and he'll be quarantined for a month. I quarantine all pigs that come onto my property. Even if they were here and they left and they came back, they get quarantined for a month. We take them to the fair, they come back, they get quarantined for a month. Betswine Ross went up to this lady's farm, was up there for about two months. She came back. She got quarantined for a month. I try to just make sure that we keep that in mind to make sure that we are practicing at least some semblance of biosecurity. So he is a bit lonely. 
He's been with other pigs. Now he's by himself. He can hear the other pigs. I don't think he can see the other pigs. So he hasn't been eating well. I, I give him feed and he kind of buries it and rolls in. And I, it's almost like a dog. A dog will roll in feces or stinky stuff. Well, he's rolling in his food. It's the most bizarre thing I've ever seen. But hopefully he will settle down. I'm just working with him, trying to be calm and patient. He's a nice looking boar. And as far as size wise goes, he was born in March. And he's probably twice as big as the other boar that I have here that was born in January. I have high hopes that he's going to be a very, very good boar for my herd. If not, we'll turn him into sausage. But at least he's here, and so I will keep you up to date with Boris and how he settles in here on 3B Farm and Homestead. All right, that is this week's Homestead Happenings. Let's jump on over to this week's Charting the Course. As I said earlier, and as I promised last week, this week's topic was supposed to be about winter watering. I was going to call it the WWW, Winter Watering Woes. And I'll say that five times fast. <laughs> but as I said on Friday, something very tragic happened. And so I've been thinking about that, processing that, and I wanted to share that with you on this episode. On Friday, I was on my way back to work after my lunch break. And as I was reaching the end of my driveway, I saw a motorcycle cross in front of me on the other side of the road out of control. And the rider was struggling to get it back under control. And eventually he was unable to, the motorcycle dug into the sod and flipped over. It launched the rider off of the motorcycle. He hit the ground and then hit the telephone pole. I immediately threw the truck into park and I'm running across the road with my cell phone dialing 911. I get across to the other side of the road and I'm assessing the situation. I, I thought the guy at this point was dead, but he was struggling to breathe. And so I'm on the phone with 911 and explaining the situation. And at this point, another person who was heading up the road towards me had stopped. He and his son got out. They came over. They're also assessing the situation. We're talking to 911 and they're saying, okay, we're going to send help. And so we're sitting there. The guy is struggling to breathe. We didn't want to move him because we didn't want to cause any more damage. And not too long after that, a nurse happened to be driving by and she pulls over and she comes over and explains that she's a nurse. And so she starts assessing the situation. I realize there's blood, nobody has gloves. And so I run back to the house, I grab a box of gloves and I come back. As I'm starting to hand out gloves to everybody, an EMT that happened to be coming by, she stops and she comes over and then another nurse happens to stop and so they're assessing the situation and they realize that the guy is starting to, to pass. And so the EMT says, we need to start CPR. And so we roll him on his back. And at that point, a trooper showed up with an AED. And so I stepped back and I said, okay, we've got professionals here. I'm going to provide support, but I'm going to let them do their thing. Eventually, the EMTs arrive, there was three ambulances, fire trucks, and they worked and worked and worked and worked on this guy, and then they transported him to, onto the hospital. I provided a statement to the police, and then I went on back to work, and of course, I'm trying to process all of this that took place because... This isn't in my wheelhouse. I'm not an EMT. I'm not a fireman. I This isn't something that I deal with on a regular basis. Went on back to work and all afternoon, it just keeps going through my mind over and over again. I keep replaying the accident and the aftermath and thinking, okay, did I do everything correct? 
that evening I was pulling out of the driveway to go somewhere and I saw some people across the road with flashlights and they flagged me down and it happened to be the parents of this gentleman and they informed me that unfortunately he didn't make it. Obviously it's a very very sobering situation and all weekend long I've been thinking about this. I've been trying to process it. I keep reliving the whole accident in slow motion, the aftermath in slow motion, and I keep asking myself, is there anything else that I could have done? Is there anything else that I should have done differently? And based on what I know with regards to first aid and based on what other people have told me, we followed the correct steps. I'm very, very lucky that my dad uh, and mom were EMTs and they've helped me process this. My brother Eric was a pilot, is a pilot, but he flew medevac in the army. And he said, Brian, this is very normal. He said, anytime that I had a a soldier die in the back of my helicopter, I would ask myself, is there anything that I could have done differently? Could I have taken off more quickly? Could I have flown more quickly? Is there anything I could have done differently that might have changed the outcome? And again, I'm very, very thankful that I have people like that that have dealt with this kind of trauma and have been able to help me process all of this. As I have been trying to process all of this this weekend, one of the things that I have been thinking about is that there is no question that we are living in a very polarized society right now. At least here in the United States, the political climate has become increasingly polarized over the last 20 years. Democrat versus Republican, Trump versus Biden, Trump versus never Trumpers, pro-life versus pro-abortion, pro-gun versus anti-gun, and the list could go on and on and on. But not only is it just a political thing, we've really become very culturally polarized. Black Lives Matter versus Blue Lives Matter, defund the police versus support the police, urban versus rural, just so many different cultural things, immigrants versus native-born Americans, just such a culturally politicized environment. And then you put on top of that the pandemic, maskers versus anti-maskers, vaxxers versus anti-vaxxers. And all of this has caused families to be torn apart, friendships to be fractured, and then the mainstream media just keeps feeding this frenzy. What does that have to do with the accident? As I have been thinking about this, this is what I saw on Friday. Nobody cared about any of that stuff. Nobody cared whether the gentleman was a Democrat or a Republican. Nobody cared about whether or not he was voting for Trump or Biden or Joe Jorgensen or Howie Hawkins. Nobody cared if he was pro-life or pro-abortion. Nobody cared what his position was on Blue Lives Matter or Black Lives Matter or whether or not the police should be defunded. Nobody cared whether or not he was wearing a mask or not. Nobody cared about his positions on vaccines. What people saw was another human being in distress and they launched into action. And it wasn't just first responders. There were random people passing by that launched in to action. Nurses and off-duty EMTs, but regular Joes like me, handing out gloves and people stopping and directing traffic. And then of course there were the first responders. And folks, they were amazing. They were amazing. I am not someone with a lot of medical training. I've been through some basic first aid courses and some CPR courses, but that's the extent of it. But let me tell you something, based on what I witnessed, I don't think there's anything else they could have done to save that guy's life. And I shared that with his mother. I told her, ma'am, I know this doesn't bring your son back, 
but I hope that it brings you some comfort to know that they fought tooth and toenail to save your son's life. You see, what I saw in the middle of that tragedy was something beautiful. It was a community united by something that is far more important than the petty nonsense that we have allowed to divide us. And folks, it made me proud to be a member of this community. And this is what I've been thinking. If we could put aside our differences for the love of a random stranger, why can't we do the same for our family and friends? And I'm not saying that some of those things that I mentioned aren't important. They are. But at the end of the day, aren't our relationships with our families and friends far more important? So what does this have to do with homesteading? Well, honestly, I I don't know if maybe there's a whole lot that it has to do with homesteading, but these are a few takeaways for me. First of all, I need a refresher on first aid and CPR. And I think any of us on, whether it's on the homestead or not on the homestead, we potentially could be confronted by situations such as what I witnessed on Friday. And we need to be able to launch into action. As I shared with you back on episode 36, homesteading can be dangerous. We need to do it safely. But we also want to be prepared if there is an emergency on our homestead that we are ready to handle it. The second takeaway for me is that my attitude towards my family has changed. When we were chasing that pig around the back 40 yesterday, I think prior to the events on Friday, I would have been a lot more exasperated with my family just because I was frustrated with that darn pig. But I realized that there was something far more important than a stupid pig running around a backfield. And I literally thought about that. I know it's bizarre, but I thought about that in the middle of chasing that pig around. And how I talked to my son and to my wife was tempered by the fact that I... I had been thinking about the importance of relationships with family and friends. My third takeaway from this whole thing is that where you live matters. Now, I can't speak to how other communities would have handled this. But, as I said earlier, I was proud to be from Washington County, New York on Friday. I was proud to be a member of this community because I thought if that was me lying there on the side of the road, those people would be fighting like hell for my life. Finally, in home setting, sometimes we get polarized as well. We fight over till versus no till, permaculture versus traditional farming and gardening practices, rotational grazing versus feedlots, organic and non-GMO versus conventional feeds. And yes, it's okay to passionately advocate for your positions and perspectives. But at the end of the day, let's temper that passion and remember that there are much more important things at play. And when push comes to shove, may we as a community rally together and fight like hell for each other. That's it for this episode of the Homestead Journey Podcast. If you've liked what you've heard and you're new, please subscribe using your favorite podcast app or platform. If you didn't like what you've heard and you'd like to complain, you can certainly reach out to me, brian at thehomesteadjourney.net, or you can also reach us on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, Reddit, MeWe, all of the links to those accounts are in the show notes. If you'd like to support the show, you can do so by sharing it with friends and family. You can also support it by writing a review on iTunes or your favorite podcast platform. 
if they so allow. And you can also support the show by going to our website, thehomesteadjourney.net slash shop. And there you will find a list of Amazon affiliate links of gear that we actually use here on our homestead. And it's not just that we use it, but we like it. If we don't like it, it doesn't make the list. But on that list is gear that we use and we like. And so if you buy through those links, a portion of that comes back to us and helps support the show. As always, the music on the show is provided by Audionautics.com. And until next time, everybody, keep up the good work.